my name is Chantal, and uh, the last 30 days have been a really wild ride for me. Um, from the miracle of uh, steps 10 and 11, uh, right down through to relapse. And what I want to share today is my experience and all of that, but also tying it to God's word and consider for each of us what it means to taste and see. I've likened it to my experiences in, in how I'm going to present it today, but I'm going to leave that there uh, with you for now and we'll see how this goes. So I'm a grateful recovering addict working recovery today and every day by the grace of God the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the sacrifice of Jesus who gave his life up for mine. I'm free from sex, love, lust, and fantasy addiction and continue to daily work towards emotional sobriety as a result of uh, identifying as a codependent, which makes me controlling, fixing, obsessing, creating care chaos, often under the guise of being helpful, useful, and caretaking. As I was just saying, most recently, I experienced a miracle of freedom from food addiction. It was short-lived, but it was a miracle for me nonetheless. I had never knew what it was like not to have physical cravings for coffee, chocolate, carbs, and sugar. I had stopped mentally obsessing about my next fix and the how and why of it while trying to fix myself in the hopes of being rid of my compulsions, relinquishing my ego and spiritual malady for conscious contact with God. I'm grateful for all the experiences in the past decade that have brought me to today. While I may not be abstinent with food, my spiritual life is definitely growing deeper one day at a time. It's through life's ups and downs, as well as learning through experience, that I've had many opportunities for reflection and growth in safe environments. Environments like Celebrate Recovery, Life Lab, the 12 Steps of AA, and the Big Book Awakening Approach. This, for me, involves taking a moment to pause reflect, ask and answer considerations as they may apply to me and my life. I have adopted this process, though imperfectly, in every area of my life. I confess I could benefit from being more committed to the process and most particularly to prayer and meditation. Yet, through other people's experiences, strength and hope, I persevere because if it is possible for them, then I know it is possible for me and that sustains me. During the course of Life Lab, we discuss our emotions. We gain a better understanding of the fact that thoughts are fleeting and feelings are fickle. We cannot rely on these to get us through each day, no matter how much havoc they may cause. They are merely indicators to a deeper problem. Like Joyce Meyer says in her straight talk about fickle feelings, feelings are a lot like unreliable people. We can't depend on them to be what we want or need them to be all the time. Not only that, they aren't necessarily interested in what's best for us, and they always want to have their way. Feelings get us excited about going shopping when we really don't have any money to spend. Been there. They'll entice us to eat chocolate when we're trying to avoid unhealthy, uh, unhealthy eating habits. Done that. And they lead us to stay up late working or watching TV when we need to get some rest to have enough energy for the next day. Definitely done that and still do that. Actually, God, um, through my recent re relapse, had me considering what it was that um, I was refusing to let go of and still participating and engaging with. So I tend to watch quite a bit of television um, under the guise that that's the way we relax as a couple. But truly, there are much better things my brain could be doing, whether it be engaging in God or even just finding a different activity to learn how to rest and be still. Unfortunately, after feelings leave a damp, sorry, after our feelings damage our life, we act end up being left alone to deal with the consequences. So I invite you to consider, do you relate to this? If so, perhaps you can write it down and have a look at it later. I confess that my own feelings get in the way of my recovery and also torment me when I decide to pray and meditate. But you don't have to take my word for it. I'm going to read an excerpt from Baptist minister and Christian author Sidlow Baxter about his prayer life struggle. He said that he began to excuse himself. He, he writes, my prayer life became a case of sinning and repenting. Every time I got down to pray, I had to start weeping and asking God for forgiveness. I had to repent that I hadn't prayed more and ask him help 
to help me or do better in the future. All such things really take the pleasure out of praying. I ask you to consider, does this resonate with you? And once you know, then you can determine your course of action. Sid's experience all came to a crisis. At a certain time one morning, he looked at his watch according to his plan. He was still bravely persevering. He was to withdraw for an hour of prayer. He looked at his watch and said, time for prayer, Sid. But as he looked at his desk and there was a miniature mountain of correspondence, his conscience said, you ought to answer those letters. So as we say in Scotland, he swithered, he vacillated. For me, that looks like something that would cause me distress and obsess. Should I pray? Should I answer the letters? Yes, no, yes, no, maybe. Just really getting wrapped up in a tailspin within my thinking. But Sid goes on to say, while I was swithering a velvet, he's from Scotland, right? Um, a velvety little voice began to speak in my inner consciousness. Look here, Sid, That's what's all this bother? You know very well what you should do. The practical thing is to get those letters answered. You can't afford the time for prayer this morning. Get those letters answered. But he still withered, and the voice began to reinforce what it had said. It said, look here, Sid, don't you think the Lord knows all the busy occupations where it starts taking up your time? You're converted, you're born again, and you're in the ministry. People are crowding in, you're having conversions. Doesn't that show that God is pleased with you? And even if you can't pray, don't worry too much about it. Look, Sid, you'd better fa face up to it. You're not one of the spiritual ones. Ouch. I don't want to use extravagant phrases, but if you had plunged a dagger into my bosom, it couldn't have hurt me more. Sid, you are not one of the spiritual ones. On many occasions, these words had been whispered in his ear by the enemy of his soul. So that morning, Sid Lowe Baxter took a, a good look at himself. This is step 10. And he found that there was a part of him that did not want to pray. But he looked more closely and found that there was a part of him that did. For him, the part that didn't was the emotions, and the part that did was the intellect and the will. Suddenly, he found himself asking, are you going to let your will be dragged about by your changeful emotions? It was then that this conversation took place between him and his will. I said to my will, are you ready for prayer? And Will said, here I am. I'm ready. So Will and I set off to pray. But the minute we turned our footsteps to go and pray, all my emotions began to talk. We're not coming. We're not coming. And I said to Will, can you stick with it? And Will said, yes, if you can. So Will and I, we dragged off those wretched emotions or cast of characters like John likes to call them. And we went to pray and stayed an hour in prayer. It was a fight all the way. The next morning came. I looked at my watch and it was time. I said to Will, come on, it's time for prayer. And all the emotions began to pull the other way. And I said, Will, can you stick it? And Will said, yes, in fact, I think I'm stronger after the struggle yesterday morning. So Will and I went in again. The same thing happened, rebellious, tumultuous, uncooperative emotions. This went on for about two and a half weeks, but Will and I stuck it out. Then one morning during that third week, I heard one of my chief emotions say to the others, come on, fellows, there's no use wearing ourselves out. They'll go on whatever we do. Will and I were able with less distraction, to get on with praying. Suddenly, one day, while Will and I were pressing our case at the throne of the heavenly glory, one of the chief emotions shouted, Hallelujah! And all the other emotions suddenly shouted, Amen! For the first time, the whole territory of James Sidlow Baxter was happily coordinated in the exercise of prayer. And God suddenly became real, and heaven was wide open, and Jesus was there, and the Holy Spirit was moving. And I knew that all the time, God had been listening. This excerpt really encourages me to persevere. It's silly of me to expect things to change overnight. I must be willing to press in, be faithful, and persist in prayer. This brings me to my topic for today, taste and taste and see what you may be wondering consider this scripture verse in its entirety taste and see that the lord is good 
What does it mean to taste and see that the Lord is good? According to the New Living Translation Life Application Bible, it is a warm invitation. One that says, come on, try this. I know you'll like it. As I trust God daily, I experience how good he is. Once I see my need for God's word and begin to find nourishment in Jesus, my spiritual appetite increases and I begin to experience more and more spiritual awakenings as I mature. Another consideration for reflection is this. How strong is your hunger for God's word? Here's how I responded. Heavenly Father, as for my recent relapse to food addiction, I confess that my desire for you and your word ebbs and flows according to my fickle feelings and fleeting thoughts. Forgive me for not seeking you first. Thank you for pursuing me anyway, for reminding me that no matter what, I belong to you and you desire to make me new, that I may fulfill the plans and purposes you have for my life. Thank you for allowing me to taste and see your goodness and separating me from my ego and my flesh when I get stuck in my trials and am resistant to experiencing all that you have for me for fear of failure, disappointment, and discouragement. Thankfully, your love and mercy trump it all. I am grateful for each trial because they are opportunities for growth and understanding. Without them, I could not experience your goodness for myself. It is through life circumstances that I get to know you. I get to trust you, I get to obey, I get to surrender, and I get to fully depend on you instead of myself. Thank you, Lord. Continue to bless me today in everything I think, say, and do. So like every other addiction, my sugar addiction became progressively worse and never better. It has taken its toll on me physically, sapped my mental energy and acuity, and put a kink in my relationship with God, hindering my growth. I have a long history of condemning myself and making self-help resources my go-to instead of pausing and asking God. I used to go and often still go to Google, unfortunately. But now most day, my first go-to prayer is this. God grant me the serenity to stop beating myself up for not doing things perfectly the courage to forgive myself because I'm working on doing better and the wisdom to know that you already love me just as I am. <clears throat> I've spent decades of overthinking and living in my head, trying to run the show that was my life. As a result, I've struggled with depression, anxiety, broken relationships, and failed jobs. Since January, I have been on a leave of absence from work due to mental exhaustion, chronic stress responses, and an inability to pivot in ever-changing circumstances due to a depressive episode. Too often, because I chose to put work and performance as a priority, I fed my need for dopamine rush and I became stuck in the fight-or-flight response. This greatly impacted my stress hormones while stroking my ego as I felt I was doing important work. This was then exacerbated by my need for perfectionism, people-pleasing, and procrastination. In the case of the latter, I developed an attitude of resistance to anyone and anything that redirected my show or even slightly dared to change my plans for the day. I encourage you to pause and consider if the following statement is true for you. When work, productivity, busyness or hustle, or insert word here, is my idol or first priority, I feel like stillness and rest are sinful. I've had that experience, those times where I can't be still because I'm so accustomed to being productive and taking care of everything in the office and at home and with the grandchildren. And the last 10 months have greatly helped me heal and refocus my spirit on God. However, there are still times where I feel like I'm not doing enough. So I'm certainly growing in what it could look like to be fully present with God and not to have those stressors and worries about um, life, which is completely out of my control anyway. The BBA way suggests that before we even start to consider step one, we read pages 84 to 88 daily and begin applying the spiritual principles of step 10 and 11. As it states on page 83, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. 
We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. So despite applying spiritual principles, I relapsed. That has been my experience in the last 30 days. The goodness of God in this, though, is that I didn't rush to Google psychoanalyze or 12-step my relapse. Rather, I immediately turned to God, sought forgiveness, and asked, now what? I've learned that when I choose to face the day with an honest, open, and willing mind, I am setting myself up for God to do something new in and through me. This brings me to my next consideration. Without a sound mind, can I truly experience freedom, let alone a daily reprieve from addiction? Second Timothy 1 says that the one seven of the Bible states, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. A sound mind thinks according to the word of God and is therefore ready to go further, sensing the flow of his spirit that dwells within me. Step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. In the past, it would have been easy for me to be vague about my spiritual experience out of fear of offending others or believing the lies that my inner critic whispered to my heart. You don't need to do this. God doesn't care about you. Modern medicine is what healed you. I see you when you secretly reach for food to satisfy your soul on every level. You try to maintain control by setting reasonable boundaries. You're still trying to run the show. If I listen to that voice, any chance of recovery would be lost. Instead, I need to take the words of God and affirm them as truth. And I can do that by practicing listening prayer, uh, meditation, and conscious contact. So what exactly have my recent spiritual experiences taught me? Well, if I align back to the big book on page 60, I was reminded I am not a saint. The point is that I am willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles set down in the big book are guides to progress. I claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection because I believe God wanted to do something new and I belong to a religious denomination that required a definite morning devotion. I also began to attend to that. My church community is part of heart, a heart strong movement, which is dedicated and committed to growing spiritually, accepting that we are created in the image of God and becoming more like Jesus. In a recent podcast, I heard a blessing by Kay Bowler for when the road is long, and I've added it to my daily prayer practice because it is what I need. It reads, Oh God, I could not have imagined that this road would be so long and so hard. Yet here I am again. Worn out body and soul. Oh God, I don't know what to do. Help me. God, have mercy on me. I've so long longed for those things because it, food and, and stress and poor functioning of my brain has caused all these issues. And then I think at least half a dozen of them in the past 10 months. So um, if people think that... Uh, if people think that only illegal substances are damaging, that is not the case. Um, the foods that I need to eat every day create this pattern where I need to consider every bite and better take care of myself. But I continue to persevere and believe that a miracle is possible. I may have failed to cling to God's word but I continue, as I continued to rely on my twisted thinking rather than securing guardrails, building high fences, and staying on the narrow path. Here the reference I'm making is to my mind, to my thinking, um, to my thoughts, uh, and my focus on that as opposed to uh, my spiritual experiences. So in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, there's just under 190 references to spiritual, and there's over 200 references to think, thought, mind. Um, and the, the, the best thought for me is going to be a thought that aligns with God's truth. But it hasn't always been the case. 
So going on with HeartStrong, our pastor invited us to embrace change and trust in God's unchanging faithfulness as he leads us into new ways of growth and purpose. He prompted us to consider this. When God tells you to break camp and move out to face a challenge, will you obey and act rather than simply listen? This was my response. In my past experience, if, sorry, my past experiences are any indication of obedience and action, then yes, I will move. I'll be ready. However, that has not always been the case. Typically, when a change comes along, I resist and rebel. I refuse to accept, and I even attempt to evade by inaction or argument. But I know that this is futile because my desire to trust and obey God has become greater than my need to control. When my resistance persists, I have discovered that it dissipates when I take the next right step. Failing to do so leads to feeding the desires of my flesh rather than accepting, believing, and turning to God. Resistance exists because of fear, fear of the unknown, like when I entertain uncertainty and doubt, fear of losing control because I need to be right, fear of incompetence, that would be how my ego relates, and fear of discomfort, just simply not wanting to do or try anything new and sticking in with the familiar things that are already in my life. Resistance can, however, be countered with steps one to three of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and by asking God for serenity. God, grant me the serenity to accept, not merely admit, that's my own emphasis, the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Your will, not mine, be done. Through this process, I'm learning to be present in every moment while coming to the table with a beginner's mind, an awakened spirit, which allows for vulnerability, mistakes, and new beginnings. I'm practicing letting go and willingness by welcoming change with open hands and a willing heart. I'm learning to enjoy making progress without knowing or try to control or figure out the outcome. Because after all, acceptance is the key if I want to continue to move through life with peace, joy, hope, faith, and love. Then on Tuesday, the pastor asked us to consider if we could believe without understanding it that a single drop of God's love changes everything. She read a prayer authored by Ted Load, which reminded me of what I already knew, but strengthened my resolve to be free of food addiction. Here's a portion of what I heard. Oh God, gather me now to be with you as you are with me, forever present. Relieve my compulsiveness. Forgive me for claiming so much of myself that I leave no room for you. Then I confessed yet again that I put coffee, chocolate, carbs, and sugar ahead of God, often seeking Java instead of Jesus upon awakening. If somehow that day I managed not to give in to, then I obsessed about it until somehow my cravings were satisfied. Sure, I could resist for a while, but rarely had I gone a full day without the satisfaction that these foods offered. I knew that it wasn't good for me. I even had an understanding of the root cause, yet and continue found myself admitting that I was powerless over these foods and that my life had become unmanageable. I came to believe that God could restore me as I repeatedly chose to turn my life and my will over to his care. I sought redemption by praying for God to forgive me and release me from this idol. Later that day, I was considering the difference between admit and accept. So I did what I usually do. I asked God, no, that would have been too easy. I Googled it, of course. Today, I share with you a fresh revelation of the difference between admit and accept. And that is because, sorry, that is because I saw God, not Google. I'm really looking for transformation in mindset, not merely more head knowledge. And having had the opportunity to prepare to speak um, twice in the last 30 days has really put me um, living in the steps. What what can I learn from it? What can I take from this? And often I've said to Vicki, even if I'm the only one that reads or writes this message, already God has changed me. So on this basis, though, I will read the stolen quote about admitting and accepting. Admitting you have a problem means you recognize, become aware, and acknowledge that a problem exists. Accepting you have a problem, however, means you take responsibility to correct the problem. 
And therein was lying the difference for me. I was making excuses. I was justifying, reasoning, being sec- secretive with my eating habits and my spending habits. Um, but thankfully, that day, it just sunk to a new level. I listened to Joyce Meyer give encouragement on the key to breakthrough. And these two considerations stood out for me. First was a reading from the Bible, which states, Therefore, put on the complete armor of God so that you will be able to resist and stand your ground. This reinforced my belief about knowing when I must resist and when I must persist or let go and let God. And having done everything that the crisis demands, reinforce the big book consideration of my willingness to go to any length for sobriety. Then I needed to stand firm in my place, fully prepared, immovable, and victorious, and hold the ground that God had given me. Secondly, it is my responsibility to partner with God, to do hard things, to persist, to be still and listen, to trust and obey, to pray, to wait patiently for my breakthrough. I finally came to the end of myself. Using my right to chemical peace of mind, I had been afraid to let go of what I had in order to try something new. There was a certain sense of security in the familiar. That's from page 416 and 417 of the big book. You know, and I did this even though it was causing me harm. How insane was that? Also from the big book, when I stopped living in the problem and began living in the answer, the problem went away. We often hear that um, Jesus is the solution, Jesus is the answer, and that has been so true for me, particularly in the last 30 days. And I've noticed that once that permeates my heart, I'll never go back to the way my last spiritual experience was. So I feel that I'm taking ground little by little and doing what, um, what God wants me to be doing So finally, coming with the sobriety part. So I had 10 days of sobriety and abstinence from uh, trigger foods, and I slipped. Because in my twisted thinking, I figured I could get away with one bite. So unfortunately, the high of this miracle of abstinence and spiritual awakening, something I so desperately desired to hold on to, not wanting to waste this beautiful gift of freedom God granted me, It withered away. After one bite, I began to beat myself up and turned away from God in shame. My prayer and meditation began to wane. I wasn't consistently practicing spiritual principles. Here I was again at the same place where I'd been before, yet with new knowledge and and, uh, kind of a roadmap to avoid the pitfalls, because in in 30 days I did have pitfalls and while I might not have seen it when I was in the thick of it I can look in retrospect and consider it and uh, turn that into some actions now I've been told that human nature that it's human nature and we are forgetful people but the recovering perfectionist in me is still inspire aspiring to be a good enough if I do that every minute of every hour of every day Finally, when it comes down to concrete, practical things, my uh, through working with my occupational therapist, we've been talking about planning, prioritizing, pacing, not specifically in the addiction, but just for a better understanding of uh, what my capacity is and what energy I can handle in a day. And she was very strong on planning. And she mentioned to me, failure to plan is planning to fail. And I've so learned that this year. And planning now gives me clear direction for what I must do next. It reduces my uncertainty and indecision and the need to obsess when anxious because it takes away the guesswork and unburdens my mind. This works for my next to-do thing. It also works for my exercise program. It works for my meal planning. If I already decided ahead of time what I'm going to eat, even though I may get an inkling or a craving, I tend to follow the plan. This has already helped me with increased energy and freedom from the time sucker of constantly trying to figure out even the most mundane things. So to wrap it up, 
According to gotquestions.org, tasting must happen before seeing. That is, our spiritual experiences bring us to spiritual enlightenment and understanding. King David in Psalm 34 desires others to taste and see. He wants them to experience what he has experienced so that they can know what he has come to know, the soul-sustaining goodness of the Lord. Because I've experienced God's gift of sobriety, even for a short time, I hunger for more of him and crave for intimacy through prayer and meditation. This experience has strengthened my hope and resolve. God's not done with me yet. From this day forward, I will do my best to be still and rest in God's presence, knowing that I am forgiven no matter what. Practically, I will practice these principles in all my affairs and maintain my spiritual fitness because I will continue to choose to pause, pray, plan, and proceed. And when I fall, which is inevitable, I will get back up and turn to God. In this moment, I encourage you to consider the following. Choose calm over chaos, serenity over stress, peace over perfection, faith over fear, and alignment with God above all else.